Okay, greeting viewers. We hope you're well and in good health. It's a pleasure to have you join us today. This is part four of our ongoing Healthy Cities series. In case you missed any of our past episodes, you can review this on our playlist on our YouTube channel, Columbia Global Centers Nairobi. When you get there, please subscribe to our channel and like our videos. Before we begin, kindly note the following. This session will be recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel in the coming week. As the session proceeds, please post your questions under the Q&A section. The speakers will answer your questions at the end of their presentation. Follow us on social media. This will ensure that you do not miss any of our upcoming programs. Our handles are at CGC Nairobi for Facebook and Twitter. I would now like to welcome Dr. Murugi Dirango to open the session. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Pauline. Welcome everyone, uh, and thank you for joining us for today's event. As Pauline has said, my name is Murugi Dirango, and I am the director of Columbia Global Center in Nairobi. Uh, CGC Nairobi is the Eastern and Southern African regional hub for Columbia University in New York. The center works collaboratively with Columbia University faculty, students, alumni, and our local partners uh, to create research scholarship and teaching opportunities. Through these engagements, the center also hosts a public dialogue to engage in, uh, the public by addressing pressing issues such as uh, the topic we'll be discussing today. I am delighted and honored to welcome you to today's webinar on multidisciplinary and multi-sector approaches to urbanism, design and development as part of our Healthy Cities series. The development of scalable and sustainable housing in the rapidly urbanizing context in East Africa presents uh, multiple challenges, including construction material supply, skilled labor, financing and affordability, environmental impact, policy and legal considerations, and planning and design. Today, Justin Garrett Moore and Fatou J will discuss their work developing design innovations to address critical issues of sustainable urban development. Justin Garrett Moore holds a Bachelor of Design from the University of Florida and a, master's, uh, a Master of Architecture and a Master of Science in Urban Design from Columbia University. He also serves as an adjunct Associate Professor of Architecture at Columbia University. Additionally, Justin has taught at Morgan State University, Tuskegee University, the Yale School of Architecture, and as a member of the Dark Matter University Network. His professional affiliations include the American Planning Association's AICP Commission, the National Organization of Minority Architects, and the Urban Design Forum. He is one of the founding board members of the Black Urbanist Collective Black Space. He serves on the boards of IOBY.org, the Youth Design Center, the Columbia World Projects, and the Van Allen Institute, MoMA, and Dumbarton uh, Oaks. Fatou J is an architect, urban design, and sustainability management consultant based in Kigali, Rwanda. She was previously the managing director of SCAT, uh, SKATE Consulting Offices in Rwanda, Burundi, and the DRC Congo. In that role, she was responsible for implementing the Swiss Corporations uh, Construction Industry Transformation Program for Africa's Great Lakes region. The program introduces affordable construction system to the region's fast-growing urban agglomerations. 
it facilitates the construction industry's shift to environment friendly production of durable building materials for the mass supply of affordable urban houses. Before joining SKATE, Fatou was a team leader for the affordable housing and neighborhood development unit at the city of Kigali Office of Urban Planning and Construction. Fatou holds degrees in architecture, urban planning and sustainability management from Princeton and Columbia universities. It is my joy and delight to welcome our speakers to today's event. And I will hand it over to Justin to uh, make his presentation. Welcome, Justin. Great, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Durango and uh, to the Columbia Global Center Nairobi for having us. Uh, as you heard in our bios, both Fatu and I uh, are uh, alumni of Columbia uh, and have been doing work uh, in the region. And so it's a pleasure to share some of our work with you. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen. Uh, give me one moment here. Uh, so for this conversation today, we really wanted to uh, talk about multiple approaches or using this kind of thread of multi uh, to address the, the many different uh, kind of concerns and challenges and, and needs for uh, urban development uh, and design. And so the, the way that we do that is multi-sector. So that's working across uh, the public sector, the private sector, the NGO sector and, and academia and institutions, uh, and it's multidisciplinary, meaning crossing uh, architecture, design, planning, real estate development, uh, ecology, sociology, economic development, a number of different approaches that are needed to address uh, some of our largest challenges. Uh, and it's uh, sort of uh, curious, right? We're, we're not from uh, the continent originally, we are uh, uh, from the United States. And so uh, we also uh, are thinking about this in the context of the African diaspora, uh, sort of the, the issues that have uh, uh, sort of impacted many black communities globally uh, that we know that exist, uh, of course, there in East Africa and Kenya and other places, uh, but really a lot of these issues are global issues uh, and there is a lot to learn uh, from multiple contexts and that it's important that we begin to think about and do this work together. So for my uh, presentation, you all have uh, uh, two presentations uh, today. Uh, for my presentation, I wanted to uh, introduce the work that we're doing in East Africa, but also uh, to connect it to work uh, uh, that I do in the United States, uh, but to connect that to uh, a, a history of work with uh, Black urbanism and community development in Black history. Uh, so this slide is an, an image of a, uh, a statement by an organization called the Flanner House, which is a Black-led organization in Indianapolis, Indiana, where I'm from, uh, that was doing community development and community work. And it says, what is it about? About people, about their needs, their abilities, the land they live on, the land they till, the food they grow, about the cities they live in, about the jobs they do, how they do them, and about the houses in which they live, about what people know and don't know and what they ought to know, ought to know to help make America still greater. So this is a prompt by uh, this, this black organization working under uh, sort of stress and strain in, in their community and thinking about uh, how they were going to do that work better. So one of those people that worked for the Flanner House was this gentleman. His name was uh, Albert Allen Moore, uh, and he was my grandfather. Uh, and he uh, did work with the Flanner House focused actually on uh, their health programs, uh, food, nutrition, uh, and health as it connected and related to the city. So you see in this image here, he's got all his healthy uh, vegetables because they ran a large urban agriculture program. So this image may look rural, but it's actually in the city. Uh, and they had over 100 acres of land that served over 600 families uh, who were able to uh, grow food uh, in the program. And the reason they did this was obviously to address issues uh, of kind of health and nutrition, uh, lack of, of fresh and affordable food, 
uh, but it was also to really connect to the social dimensions, uh, talking about access to jobs and opportunities and income for people, uh, both young and old, uh, men and women. Uh, and as they were doing this work, they were thinking of all the different systems that required, again, the multiple approaches, the multiple disciplines, the multiple needs that were there. So, uh, so for example, here, okay, you can grow the food, but then they needed to can and process the food uh, as well and, and find ways uh, to do the work. But the systems continue, thinking continues. It's okay, we have the food, we have the food process, but people didn't necessarily know how to cook and prepare the food. Uh, so they actually built this space in their neighborhood uh, at a community center where there's, as you see in the image, a demonstration kitchen uh, that they use to teach people from the neighborhood uh, how to cook uh, the food that was grown in the gardens. And so what's important about this kind of multiple approach is to think about how important the social connections and social dimensions are to any type of community or uh, a sort of systems-based work. The image on the left is a sociograph uh, where they went to the neighborhood, which is a predominantly black, predominantly low-income neighborhood. Many, at the time, people would call it a slum. Uh, we wouldn't use that terminology today, but uh, it, it was no running water, uh, no uh, paved streets, a, a lot of difficult conditions, sanitary issues. And so they went into that community and they talked to people and they learned uh, like that first slide I showed, uh, what did people need? What did they know? What did they not know? Uh, what were their uh, sort of needs and capacities and mapped those out to find where uh, there was the opportunity for growth. And what they did with this information was they created multiple programs around health, around employment, uh, but also around urban development and housing. Um, so they got the uh, people together and they developed a plan for a, a housing redevelopment and neighborhood redevelopment scheme for that black community. Uh, so you see on, on the left here, there they platted out uh, uh, the plan where they were gonna redevelop and rebuild uh, housing. And on the right is an image, sort of a diagram for how they were going to do the work. Um, and so they created a self-help housing construction model where families would be able to contribute their labor uh, in exchange for equity in order to, to build uh, new housing in the neighborhood. Once those houses were completed and built, they would be able to get a mortgage. Uh, and then the funds from the, the mortgage would go back into the fund to generate new housing. And what was exciting about this was is that uh, it was a way for uh, kind of low-income, Black, uh, marginalized people uh, to be able to see their vision um, for the community. And this uh, was uh, planned by and designed by Black uh, architects. And so this is what that um, kind of self-help construction model looks like. The families were uh, able to uh, contribute their labor in exchange for equity. Uh, and they were able to complete these houses, which added up to an entire neighborhood. Uh, so I'm going to play here a quick video, or I hope I am. A special ceremony in August 1950 marked the beginning of construction by Planner House Homes Incorporated. The first ground was broken by future owner, a disabled war veteran whose home was financed locally by Railroadmen's Federal Savings and Loan Association. As a matter of fact, a large part of the residential property in the project area was sold to Flanner House Homes Incorporated. Flanner House is a red feather agency with a half century record of helping people help themselves through community projects and fundamental education. As a project in self-help home building, it provided leadership in establishing Flanner House Homes, a corporation which furnishes capital, voluntarily subscribed by leading citizens, to enable families to build their own homes. Each family is chosen on the basis of good health, personal responsibility, family stability, and the ability to work with others. The head of each family puts in a minimum of 20 hours a week on the home building project in which he's participating. When Ann has worked the required number of hours, 
and his house is completed, he obtains a mortgage loan from a local financial institution. His labor provides the equity. The proceeds from the mortgage loan go to Flanner House Homes as a payment for the land and material used in construction, thus replenishing the capital and allowing additional projects to be started. Most mortgages are insured by FHA or the Veterans Administration. So you would have heard there all of the different a special systems. You would have heard there all the different layers of systems, right? They talked about labor, mortgage loans, construction training, uh, many, many different kinds of approaches that were needed uh, to, to accomplish this work. Um, so you see here in this slide, uh, uh, outline in red is the area where uh, uh, there was no development, there was no sewers, no anything uh, in this low-income community, uh, and they were able to then develop uh, uh, you know, an entire new neighborhood that included parks, community, of facilities and of course, all of the homes built by the families. Now outlined in orange, there is Lockville Gardens, which was a government built uh, social housing project. And what we see is as we move forward to uh, kind of more current times, this community that uh, this group built because they had done a sort of multi-system, multi-sector approach, including the families uh, was able to uh, sustain, whereas the social housing that the government built uh, had a lot of issues, uh, crime, uh, poor, poor maintenance, and was ultimately uh, demolished. And so uh, kind of with this prompt and kind of knowing this history, there's this, con uh, the next concept I want to introduce is to think about kind of community practices uh, uh, when you think about kind of healthy development and again, multiple approaches and multiple types of work. And so this is a, a project that I've done more recently called Urban Patch in Indianapolis, uh, a neighborhood where I grew up. And this is where there were uh, large numbers of vacant uh, houses and vacant land, uh, sort of poor, poorly invested in uh, properties. It looked like this one, for example, a vacant house. Uh, and we did this sort of simple approach, which is more incremental in nature, more community led in nature uh, to upgrade and improve those properties uh, to do renovation and rehabilitation uh, for things like affordable and lower cost housing. Uh, and again, it was all the systems, right? The different kinds of work and labor needed to, to actually accomplish this were, were difficult. But from the systems approach, we were also looking at not just the housing, but what was going on with the whole community. And so there are also these large uh, areas of vacant land where there used to be buildings that were demolished uh, or land that just wasn't cared for. And so simultaneously with doing the housing projects, we're doing work uh, like uh, bringing back uh, access to fresh and, and uh, healthy food uh, in the community by installing things like community gardens. Uh, but you see in the background of the image, uh, we're also doing things like community improvement involving young people from the neighborhood. These are students from the local high school uh, who were able to contribute their time and, and uh, uh, talent uh, to helping to beautify this public space, making it a source of kind of pride and, and connection for the community. And as we're doing all this work, we're thinking about all the different components. So the labors, uh, for example, making sure that there's local employment so that people from the neighborhood are able to get access to the jobs uh, and opportunities there. We're thinking about the social dimensions. Uh, so this is, uh, uh, I showed the image before of canning. Uh, this is where uh, we provide canning opportunities for people to prepare uh, uh, the food. And it's a way for neighbors and different people in the community from different backgrounds to come together and, and, and to have uh, greater connections through their common and shared needs. And we all even think about this from an environmental approach and we've done uh, work in the neighborhood that looks at uh, uh, the ecology of the city. And so this is a project called the Redbud Project uh, where we planted redbud trees, which is a type of uh, indigenous tree, a, a native species tree to that community and did work to plant them all around um, the neighborhoods and doing that in a way that was to sort of help with the overall improvement of the neighborhood. 
The map at the upper left shows uh, in red and green areas that were either vacant or uh, low, low assessment, low improvement uh, in the neighborhood. And so there was a large concentration of these spaces. And so we took over vacant land and as a, as a way to kind of hold space, uh, we planted redbud trees uh, to both improve the environment, but also to kind of hold the land uh, for future development and thinking about that process over time. Uh, and so this is uh, kind of when we kind of first started the project a number of years ago, uh, and this is it today. So kind of growing improvement in and with the community and providing uh, uh, kind of beauty and, and kind of positive transformation, environment, health, uh, all coming together through our projects. And again, this has a social component and social layer. So this is one of the families uh, with the trees. We've given away over 300 trees. Uh, and so the woman is holding in her hand, it's a contract to take care of the tree. So that's the exchange. You get the free tree, but you agree to take care of it. And so it's this idea of kind of social connections and systems to, to uh, provide for the maintenance of the space as well. And finally, um, I showed the kind of the image of my grandfather. One of the things that he ran was a, a cooperative grocery store. So a way to provide fresh and healthy food to his neighborhood way back. And so we worked with the Flanner House, which that organization still exists, uh, to develop a new uh, community grocery store uh, uh, in, in uh, the neighborhood. And so it was great. They put a kind of a mural image of my grandfather um, on the building, but it's most importantly is that there's now the ability to kind of recover this history of providing uh, for fresh food, but also uh, safe places for young people, uh, ways to connect to green space and gardens uh, in that community. So again, I kind of return to this, this slide and, and to ask this question is we think kind of broadly what's needed in all communities. So this is what, you know, they were talking about in a 1950s low income black community in Indianapolis, what is it about? Uh, I would argue that this is really what it's about still for so many communities globally. Uh, and after uh, having visited uh, East Africa and, and frankly other places throughout the world, I think this, this uh, sort of challenge does translate. It's about people, about their needs, about the jobs they do, how they do them, about the houses in which they live, what they know, and what they ought to know, right? Um, so with that, um, I'll kind of transition to work that we've been doing uh, uh, in East Africa directly, kind of learning from uh, the, the work that I shared with you both from history, but also work that we're doing presently in the United States. Uh, and so we brought Urban Patch to Kigali. Um, uh, Fatu is gonna share more kind of the broader framework that we're plugging into but the very long story short is that Fatu and I went to uh, college together. She invites me to come visit and I get sort of just enthralled by uh, the place, but also the challenges there um, uh, in terms of work and, and decided to test out or try what would happen if we sort of adapted the work that we were doing in, with Urban Patch to the, the East African context and, and in Kigali specifically. And so uh, I showed that kind of systems diagram that that Flanner House had about kind of uh, kind of a revolving loan fund essentially uh, for for the construction development of of housing, explicitly affordable housing. And so we're looking to do a similar uh, approach in in East Africa, uh, where uh, we take this combination. Uh, in this case, looking at uh, local uh, brick masonry construction that Fatu will speak about. Uh, more later, I'm sure, uh, but providing ways that there's sort of local economic development, but also as a way of lowering costs, uh, both environmental and economic costs to produce affordable housing, but doing that in a way that uh, uh, has a mix of affordable housing. And this was really our, our premise was that instead of building concentrated low income housing at scale, which from the United States perspective, we know produces in the long term things like uh, income segregation, uh, inequality, spatial inequality, uh, and, and frankly, a number of, of problems. And so the idea of, of doing more 
economically integrated development in neighborhoods, even at the building scale, is something that we wanted to, to demonstrate and then to show how it can scale um, uh, into future projects. And so that uh, work involved a, a lot of different layers of analysis, everything from looking at zoning and different types of policies to financial modeling, looking at costs, uh, land costs, uh, and, and calibrating this mix of how more market rate or higher income people would balance with uh, more affordable or, or uh, kind of more moderate income people in the development of housing, but also thinking about where we would do that work. So thinking about, again, the system, so access to transportation, access to services uh, being primary, and then looking at all the different factors that weigh into that, uh, uh, namely land cost. And in the case of Kigali, which is very hilly, uh, things like topography that can significantly impact um, construction costs and, and long-term value. And so what we developed was a financial model that looked at how we could mix incomes in the building uh, and actually found a way to kind of target neighborhoods that were the higher value neighborhoods, which of course was connected to the, the more infrastructured, sort of the better serviced and resourced neighborhoods as a way to create a new paradigm where uh, more affordable or moderate priced housing could be located in the higher value areas as a matter of social equity. Uh, and so this was a, a site that we selected uh, in, in Kibagabaga and Kigali uh, and as part of the, the work with um, uh, the, the Swiss SDC ProEco program that looked at things like uh, supply chain, uh, uh, training of, of skilled labor and a number of different conditions, we were able to utilize this um, uh, Roloch bond construction method uh, to build housing. And you can see that there are a lot of jobs. Uh, there are a lot of different skilled trades and a lot of work and opportunities for uh, people to develop this housing. And this is our kind of final results. It's an eight unit condominium housing development that includes uh, three units of uh, moderate income, kind of lower price housing that's affordable to sort of a middle-class Rwandan uh, person. Uh, and then there are four market rate uh, apartments uh, that are meant to sort of finance uh, the income. And the last thing I'll say is that it was important as we did this work that uh, we were targeting the same level of quality and care for all of the units, whether it was a market rate, kind of a more higher income unit or a more affordable or moderate income unit uh, that they, they both were able to enjoy the same quality location, the same quality services, uh, but also the same quality of space uh, and design. And that uh, we're very proud that we were able to turn the vision, the kind of the rendering uh, into a reality. Um, and so with that, I will turn it over to my friend and colleague, uh, Fatu, to share her work. Thank you, Justin, um, and great presentation. So um, uh, hello, everybody. I see a few familiar names in the chat room. So um, some of this you may have already heard, um, but it's my pleasure to be able to share it again today. Um, as um, was mentioned in the introduction, I've been working here in Kigali for the past eight years. Um, I'm passionate about cities, specifically the African city. And uh, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity to be able to witness its development. So in order to complement the healthy cities discussion that we're having today, I thought I would share um, something from my most recent work. So, but I'll also give you the contact numbers for uh, the people who are responsible for it now. Um, as of last month, I'm no longer the managing director of SCAD Consulting um, here in Rwanda working on this project, but I think it's really important and really relevant to the work that's being done through the project. And so that's what I'll share with you today. So um, what I'd like to share with you is a presentation that um, and information that we were working on through uh, a project that is financed by the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation. So it's SDC for short, and SCAT Consulting, which is a Swiss um, consulting firm that was mandated um, by the Swiss Embassy to be able to put this project uh, in place here in the Great Lakes. 
And so, um, you know, the title of my presentation today will be addressing the challenges of mass supply of climate responsive urban buildings in Rwanda. Um, but of course, I will also focus on um, work being done in Burundi and, and Eastern Congo, because the project is in all three of those areas. And so, um, just to give you a small background, SCAT Consulting, um, again, is the small um, uh, Swiss consulting firm that's involved in anything with innovative building materials and also um, uh, applied technologies all around the world. Um, and they've worked in close collaboration with the Swiss Agency for Cooperation and Development for many years now. And um, they even had a project here in the 80s, here being in Rwanda and Burundi in the 80s, um, uh, working together to be able to kickstart um, uh, production of bricks at mass scale. And so the mandate that the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation gave to SCAT Consulting in the Great Lakes in 2013 was to enable the local construction industry to be able to supply the green and affordable buildings and to, to create decent employment for these cities that are transforming and this population that is growing at a really quick rate. Um, the new people that keep in contact, I can come back to that at the end, um, but um, they, they can answer any questions um, that you may have about some of the work that I'm showing today. Um, but just, just to, I think the most important thing to know is to say wh where we are and what's happening today in this context. And the fact of the matter is, is that this is one of the world's fastest urbanizing areas. If you look at the urban growth map uh, and you look at the continents, you see that all of the regions that are uh, uh, kind of on fire, those are the ones that are leading the urbanization, uh, the rapid urbanization rates for uh, on the African continent. And actually Rwanda was one of the fastest urbanizing up till about 2018. And now Burundi is set to take over and to be able to continue this fast trend. But what does that mean and what does it look like? It means that it means that the urban expansion is happening largely informally. If we take the four cities, the, the four major cities that are in these country, three countries that I mentioned, so from Kigali to Bukavu in Eastern Congo, Ngoma in North Kivu, uh, also in Eastern Congo, and Bujumbura in Burundi, you can see that each one of these cities is, is composed with a, uh, of a small, towards the top of the, uh, the top of the image, a small portion of formal house, of formal construction, but basically um, a large, the largest portion is informal. And so what, what we know is that by 2050, there will be 20, more, 20, 20 million more people living in these cities. And um, which means that it, there are gonna be uh, 5 million um, new uh, homes required to be built in these areas to accommodate all these people coming to these cities. And just to compare, the GDP of, of this area is uh, about 20 billion. And in uh, DC alone, for example, in Washington, DC, that's equivalent to 400, they have a GDP of $490 billion. So you can see the differences and really how we have to figure out solutions that can meet the budget that we have, the resources in terms of materials, the resources we have in terms of skills and capacity, and figure out really how to be able to accommodate and make this urban expansion something that is uh, beneficial and profitable uh, for the cities and, its, uh, and their inhabitants. So one of the main problematics that we have though today is that, you know, it's mostly the construction that's happening is it's happening in cities, but it's using techniques, construction techniques that are more appropriate for village houses. And so you have that village house in an urban context. And so instead of um, concrete and, and, um, and bricks and uh, high rise urban buildings, um, you have a lot of small, uh, uh, predominantly informal buildings made of uh, mud and, and, and wood in some cases. And so what this means is that if you look at the, this picture, which is actually an aerial photograph of Bukavu, this represents about 3,000 houses. Um, we sat there and counted. <laughs> it's about 3,000 houses. This represents the urban expansion of 10 days for these four cities that I showed you. So really, if we don't have a plan about how to build proper urban buildings, we will continue to have this condition of, um, of uncontrolled development, of low story buildings made out of um, um, materials and techniques that don't allow to take, make proper use of the land and also make sure that we ensure the safety of the people that are living there. And so the other thing that's happening is that there are many low frequent, low intensity disasters. The climate is changing and those 
Dressy, Josephine, and Pacific, who can, can attest with me, uh, those who are on the call as well, that the climate has changed drastically here and there are more severe weather events and, and thunderstorms, and that there are major damages um, due to stormwater um, and landslides that happen almost during every rain. And so it becomes really quite important that we think about solutions to be able to allow people, again, not only to be able to densify, but also be able to make sure that people are in safe quality uh, and, and affordable housing. In Congo, um, there are settlement fires almost every year. They predominantly build in wood. And you will see in many of the of the, the valleys is that there will be a fire that will take out 200 homes in the matter of minutes. And then people build back up. And maybe six, six or eight months later, there's another fire that again destroys some housing. So again, the need for solutions. And this is right now what the reality is in terms of reconstruction in, in, um, in Bukavu, so in uh, Eastern Congo. And it happens rather quickly because people obviously need shelter. So there is no time to move to another location. And as these cities densified more, uh, so quickly, there is also no land available for people to be able to settle easily elsewhere. That being said, so those are the existing challenges we have now, but then the vision of the future is also a challenge. You know, the government, uh, especially here in Rwanda, has beautiful visions and regulations to support it, to be able to think about what is the next vision of, um, what is the next vision, this here is of Kigali, but also of the secondary cities. And there's been similar thinking also in Burundi and in Bukavu also, where new master plans are also underway. And so the question is, how do we get ourselves prepared? How do we get the cities prepared? How do we get the inhabitants, whether it be the builders or the investors who are going to be financing some of this to be able to um, respond and uh, apply some of, these, uh, some of these new regulations and meet the ambitions, especially when the reality of urban housing and when we see the income pyramid on your right is that really the form, there are very few formal dwelling units being supplied and they're all at the top of the pyramid and everything else is uh, substandard and informal. So how do you begin to balance what the vision is versus what the current reality is and what does that transformation process actually look like? And that word transformation is really key to the project and the vision that the Swiss had was to, how to have uh, the Swiss come in and assist with the planning and financing of this transformation from one way of, of thinking and living and working in the city to another way of being and, and living in the city. Um, many of the builders that we know also struggle with storied housing. So this is a, um, a, um, a picture from Bukavu. Um, and so again, if we're gonna go to urban housing, we need to make sure that we have the skills. There are a few contracting firms that actually have the capacity to be able to build tall story buildings, local firms. You know, there are foreign firms of course that are here, um, but the idea would be to have the local firms really benefit from this opportunity of cities that are in the process of transformation. And so um, there are new urban vulnerabilities that are also happening, again, when you aren't due to the fact that the construction techniques are not appropriate. And so what happens is that people say, okay, well, we'll build, we will build tall, but we'll do it with cement. And Rwanda is a landlocked country, as is Burundi and Congo. And so we have to, with, and these countries have very small line reserves. And so we have to look outside to be able to get the materials to build what we think are the proper urban buildings. And so the result is, of course, environmentally, uh, we know cement is not extremely friendly, but also in terms of incomes and workers, that we're giving all the jobs of building material production to um, other, other, other countries, neighboring countries. And it's precisely that capital that actually, if properly reinvested in our cities, they could employ people. And once those people have money in their pockets, they're then able to purchase housing and so on and so on in the cycle. So it's really about how can we think about a new system to allow us to uh, take advantage of the young labor that we have here, um, give them the proper skills, rethink the way that we build and get the economy going through, all driven by the intense demand that there is for affordable housing. And so what happens is because that's, that, that cycle is not yet in place, people are scrambling to build with whatever they can. And so the production of building materials right now, um, there is a small cement production, but mostly it's these fired bricks and they're tree fired bricks. And of course, environmentally, there's already a deforestation problem in this region, um, you know, since the 60s, 1960s, there have been massive loss of forest cover in, in Burundi, DRC, and, and in Rwanda. And so continuing with these practices of um, um, cutting trees to, do, uh, to burn bricks is incredibly harmful to the environment. 
So again, how do we think differently? If our local solutions right now aren't environmentally friendly and our cement-based uh, foreign solutions aren't as well, what can we do to actually be able to rethink uh, how, how it is that we're working? And so the project, which is called Pareco, so promoting off-farm employment through the uh, climate responsive uh, construction material production, is to reduce the urbanization's climate impact. But then it's also at the same time to tap the unused employment potential. And by doing that, we can put them together and we can actually create safe urban buildings at mass scale that um, minimize the impact on the environment, but then also, of course, create a maximum number of jobs. And so just to let you know in terms of numbers, and my colleague uh, was, you know, we spent a lot of time discussing um, what these numbers actually mean. And I think the best way to tell you is to say, okay, by 2050, that's where all the new benchmarks are in terms of urbanization, in terms of master planning um, and, and, and projections. And so you would need 5 million new urban dwellings, again, in these, in these four cities. Um, you would need, you know, and if we continue the way that we are, that would be about 300,000 employments that are being lost to the cement industry. So basically given to, um, I love Kenya dearly, love Uganda, but we're giving all those employments to them because they're able to produce the cement in quantities and volumes that we're not, and then bringing it over to Rwanda. Um, this would also mean if we then continue to rely with the cement on brick infill using bricks that were made uh, traditionally, and that's over 100 million trees that are unnecessarily cut. And in terms of emissions, that's 40, 40 million um, tons of CO2 that would be unnecessarily emitted unless we can figure out a way to do things differently. And with our project, uh, with the SCAT's project and SDC's project, we think that there really is a way to do so. And so the mandate, again, is to facilitate that green change, that transformation in the urban housing supply chains. And so if you look on the left of this slide, that is a map of what the formal housing supply chain looks like. All those actors that you see from the person who is driving the truck to deliver materials to site, from the broker who is selling those materials, the developer who has a project, the engineer, uh, the, the, the banker, the seller, all those 32 people along the supply chain are all necessary in order for uh, us to deliver housing at mass scale, proper uh, built to code housing that is safe and uh, also uh, cost effective. And so what the project does is not replace any of the actors along that supply chain. So it, you see those orange bubbles, those are actually the, the, the ways that the project intervenes to create again these missing links, to build or broken links, um, they're broken and missing in some cases, um, to be able to reinforce uh, these supply chains, to allow them to function properly, create those jobs, and deliver those, house, those houses. And so in the supply chain, you know, we could divide them up into different categories, certain elements. So there's the building material production um, aspect, there's the trade and quality certification aspect of the supply chain that also needs to be developed. The concept design and engineering, people need to know what to build, how to build it, how to engineer it properly. Um, housing finance portions, how to be able to get affordable mortgages and people to, to be able to afford um, these new constructions that are put on the market. Also construction technologies, what can we do to make things simpler, to make things safer, especially since this is a, a, this is a seismic area. And then of course end user finance is, you know, again, is how do people uh, start to be able to get those, those new um, uh, financial products to be able to access this type of housing. So the supply chain really is, is quite involved and our strategy is we act as industry facilitators to be able to fix those links at all different levels. And so in the concept design and engineering, some of the things that uh, the project developed was, you know, dweller driven settlement upgrading methods. Um, and there's a currently a fantastic project uh, that's happening now with that. Um, also about proposing typologies and what they look like and pre-engineered construction designs. Uh, on the construction side, um, looking at new technologies like um, new, new wall technologies, new slab technologies, again, that are easier to build, safer, and more cost effective. Um, the program offer, also offers trainings for contractors and masons, and then deals with the issues of quality management and inspection, which are critical. Um, unless there are regulations in place for quality, um, and unless there's a, an educated client to, to, to demand quality, it won't be delivered. And that, of course, poses problems in terms of, in terms of safety and also being able to produce at, at, at large scales. And so also um, we've done research in terms of on the aspect of climate responsive building materials. So that's low carbon technologies for load bearing brick walls, designing machines that, produce, that, um, that 
designing machines that produce uh, building materials that uh, require less cement, and then actually coaching the brick makers. So really the project and, and our intervention was at all different levels of, of, this, uh, of this supply chain. And so one of the first things to do then was to say, okay, if the affordable home is one of the things that will unlock, um, we hope, this supply chain, let's build a first one. And so what you see on the left is what we call the 8 million house. And that's a 10,000, at the time it was equivalent to $10,000. Um, we built it in August, 2017 in, um, in two months. <laughs> and I have to admit, I spent the night on the site many times. Um, but the idea was to show what you could actually do um, with, uh, with new construction materials. There is a, a reinforced uh, structure inside. You don't see it. So even though you don't see columns, this is a quite sturdy structure. Um, it's a two bedroom house with kitchen and toilet. And um, we built it in the middle of the, um, of the expo grounds here in Kigali to show people that yes, it is possible to actually build affordable, safe housing. And um, so this cost of, of $10,000 includes um, it includes all the building materials, taxes, a uh, small contractor profit of 20%, 25%, and the labor. So everything is included except for the land and the engineering costs which we provided. And so we use this walling technology that you see on the left, which is a, a cavity wall, but that cavity wall can be reinforced in order to make the structure seismically resistant. And we've since then, when we started with this one model house, it wasn't to start to start to stop there. It was to show how these houses could be aggregated, so stacked on top of one another, brought together like Justin did into a multifamily unit to be able to really build um, uh, a maximum uh, amount of housing, meeting the the density regulations that we have here in Kigali, which are quite stringent because the land is quite hilly, and um, and there are um, uh, quite a few people coming to the city. And so what we were able to show by doing this is that your typical affordable urban building design, you know, is about $350 per square meter. With our optimum design, which is um, by stacking, uh, you know, the floors, um, so if cement and roof sheets are the most expensive elements of your building, if you have those, it's actually cheaper to build up than it is to build sideways. And so we were able to bring the cost per square meter down to about $200 per square meter. And all of that by really looking at what types of building technologies are we using. So on the right, you know, we've analyzed the cement block wall, the traditional brick wall, the industrial brick wall, and then what we're calling the smart cavity brick wall, which is the one all the way on the right. And you can see not only is there a cost differential, but in terms of energy consumption and the production of these, of these walls, there is a marked difference between what you can do with a properly produced brick wall and then what's happening with cement, uh, with cement block walls, for example. And then the fuel type, you can go from fossil fuels to 100% bio waste. And the CO2 that's emitted is also reduced, as well as uh, through the reduction of the quantity of cement mortar that you're using. And so again, what we're doing is we're shifting not only the technology, but we're shifting the amount of, of where that money is spent. We're spending more money on the brick part of the wall and less money on the cement. And since the brick is made locally, then that money stays here in the economy, as opposed to going outside to our to our wonderful neighbors. But um, we we need that, that energy that energy into the system here as well. And so, in addition to doing you know live research like that, so demonstration buildings, you know, the project also developed then a series of um, a, a small booklet. It's kind of like t-shirts. So it's small, medium, large, extra large, and, and XXL. So basically what we did was come up with housing solutions for all different sizes and all different costs, all different price points. And then we engineered them and we made those available to the public. Everything is open source. And so this is exactly the catalog that Justin took when he started building his, his, uh, his unit in Kibagabaga, is he took the catalog and, and built the XXL version, uh, multifamily duplex, and then um, had, all the, had all of the, um, the, the designs and the engineering already done for him so that he could immediately go to site. And that's one way that we're trying to facilitate the, um, you know, the, the, the ease in which um, developers and builders can actually access affordability. Um, what's been fantastic for us is to see, in addition to Justin's, uh, uh, what we call our copycat buildings, in addition to Justin's project and the Urban Patch Kigali project, this is a mapping um, as of uh, last summer of all the, 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 the 
copycat projects that exist just in Rwanda. I can show you Burundi and Congo as well. I'll show you Rwanda um, here, and, and, uh, but basically across the region, it's been duplicated 2,000 times. And so each square that you see on this map is not, um, is not a building, it's a project. So there might be multiple units on each one of those sites. So it's thrilling for us to be able to see uh, the way that this has taken off. That first building was built in, in August, 2017. And um, all these copycats have happened uh, since that time. So it's been quite, um, it's been, uh, quite a thrill. And so just to give you a, 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 a look, um, the technology is now being used um, to build the IDP model villages here, which are the villages um, built by, with the support of the government of Rwanda to um, be able to resettle people from high risk zones, but also to be able to uh, facilitate better settlement in the rural areas. So it's been adopted by, by uh, a whole host of people for both high end and low end housing. And it's been, um, I have to say quite fascinating to see the way that uh, it continues to adapt. And so in order to support that, of course, that the, those design initiatives that are happening for low-cost housing, you need to be able to support production as well. And so the other thing that the project does, as I showed you on that supply chain, is it really needs to facilitate industrial investments. So show what modern brick making technologies look like, what a modern brick looks like, what the machines uh, that you can use to be able to produce, um, to produce uh, these quality products. Uh, that in the end are more affordable. How does all that work? And so that's what uh, part of what the, the project has done as well. And so this is an example of one that will be inaugurated actually. Um, uh, next week will be the first firing. Um, but just to zoom in, the annual production uh, here is about 2 million bricks per year. So that's about 100 affordable homes uh, every year. The job creation, it's 55 jobs per million bricks that are created. And the environmental benefits is this is every year could, could um, reduce about 2,000 tons of, of CO2. So this becomes really quite, quite important. And uh, we have all different scales of, of brick making uh, factories, depending upon whether in the rural area and urban area, and also what means um, the, the, investor, the investor has. And so our, the work really of the project is to accompany people into the investment that will then be able to support the urbanization uh, agenda. And so again, on the right, a map of where all these different, um, all these different kilns and factories are, are located that have been um, supported by the project since 2013 when it started. The other thing is to think, okay, that is the larger scale of an entire factory, but until those factories are put into place, we still need houses today. And so the idea was to rethink, okay, what are what have we seen in the region and how can we use that to be able to kickstart this, 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 the, the production of, of modern bricks and blocks. And so these simple extruder machines are something that we saw a version, uh, the team saw a version in, in uh, Uganda and came here and redesigned those machines. The machine costs about $1,500 and is capable of making about, um, uh, I would say, uh, um, every 10 days can produce sufficient bricks for one of those little model houses that I showed you. So that's really not bad for, for $1,500 and it's entirely manual and it just takes three people to use it. Um, and so this is also a way to be able to get a better quality brick, um, not just a hand molded brick, but a better quality brick that then can fire better and um, uh, be used for a load bearing uh, wall construction. And so using those technologies, that kind of mobile technology, what we thought about was um, to, to be able to meet the demand that we have today was what types of solutions uh, can we do uh, to, to jumpstart production. And so one of them is this in situ brick production. And so what you're seeing here is a, is a real site. And what we did was we set up a temporary kiln and we're calling that the septic kiln because uh, this is a project that has 19 affordable housing, um, uh, 19 dwelling units. Again, you'll see it's the row house typology that was uh, promoted by, that is promoted by uh, the project. And so the kiln that was built uh, or the, the septic tank that is the appropriate size for this uh, small development we use that septic kiln, we use that, that uh, septic tank as a kiln, put a temporary chimney on it, uh, brought in temporary hangers, uh, those temporary machines and trucked in um, clay so that you can actually begin to produce and fire those bricks on site and use them immediately for construction. At the end of the brick production, the chimney can be dismantled, the hangers can all be taken away and the, 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 
the underground kiln can be, you know, retrofitted back into or upscaled into the septic tank and connected to the houses. And then this team can actually move to another site and deliver their services that way. And so while we're waiting for the industry to scale up, these are the types of solutions that um, our project designs to be able to help um, investors like Justin and Urban Patch Kiyali who are interested in building um, affordable housing uh, in, in, in the city context. And so you'll see in image number three, all the way on the left, there's that um, underground kiln that's fired from the top. Again, 100% with um, bio waste. And, um, and doing this, the houses are able to be built uh, directly on site. Um, and the quality can also be inspected by the investor. So he can really control his entire supply chain. And this is what the site actually looks like. So you'll see in the distance, um, the, the chimney there, you'll see the temporary hungers that we uh, had in place. The, the site manager is the, is the woman Uridi, which you see in the pink shirt. She is counting what we call green bricks before. Um, those are bricks that are um, ready to be fired. And then you'll see all the way on the right, someone who's actually starting to build uh, the building with the cavity wall there. So everything is happening on a small site. Um, and what's most interesting is, of course, through self-production, you're able to get a much better cost uh, right now for the brick than you would on the market. So this is another way that you're able to control um, and bring down costs to be able to meet those affordability targets uh, that we have. So those are just a few examples of the things that we do. Here is the project um, under construction. You can see the bricks are of, of quite nice quality and a, a beautiful red color. And again, all of this is, these are little ecosystems that they can work on site and then be deployed elsewhere as we wait for the industry to transform. So um, I, I will stop there. Um, maybe another day we can talk about the, the larger implications at the scale of the city with upgrading and the potentials to do um, in situ upgrading by reorganizing and bringing together um, neighbors on small plots to build this kind of dense housing. But I think for today and the concepts of healthy cities and what health actually means in terms of the environment, but what it also means in terms of the local economy, I, I hope that I've been uh, able to provide um, some information for you. Um, and again, if, if you'd like to um, be able to be in touch with the project, um, my successor, um, uh, Enrico Moriello, would be more than happy to answer any questions. And then, of course, there's another colleague in Switzerland who also does backstopping for the project. And so I, I move on to kind of work on these things um, uh, you know, as a private consultancy basis, um, but the project is still there and very active. And um, it's been a pleasure to share some of the some of the outputs of the project with you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Fatu. Uh, that was uh, wonderful, and and thank you for kind of sharing, you know, really how complex and and wide ranging uh, all all of this work is. Um, so we have uh, already a number of questions in the chat. So we'll, we'll sort of self uh, moderate here, but uh, if folks do have other questions, you can use the Q&A function and we'll do our best. We have, looks like around 30 minutes uh, left of our time. We'll do our best to kind of work through uh, the questions. Um, so let's get started with, uh, I believe Lillian sent one uh, that was also from the chat. So maybe let's take care of that one first. Um, so it says, uh, great work. I'm especially curious to know how you think a uh, model of procuring affordable housing projects, meaning the planning, the financing, and the implementation can be replicated elsewhere in Sub-Saharan Africa especially. And what are some of the barriers and challenges that you think are, are, that people are likely to face? Um, so I'll, I'll start with that because I've got kind of a weird um, you know, I'm an architect and planner, but I'm now also a developer. Uh, and so I can answer this maybe from the perspective uh, from, from uh, kind of actually doing and developing a project. And I would say the, the, there are so many different facets of challenge <laughs> uh, to this work. Uh, so a, a key concern and issue that we've come up against is, is we're trying to target uh, what I would call everyday people. We're, we're not necessarily targeting the, the lowest of incomes, but even just sort of working everyday people don't have great access to be able to finance um, uh, the housing. Uh, 
uh, and so access to mortgages or or sort of just different paradigms of of ways to to pay for a kind of a higher quality of construction that is one challenge it's very difficult because you just don't have control over it um, we've been able to to sell our our units but it's it's you know they're sort of cream of the crop exceptional people that were able to to make that happen uh, and so there definitely need to be within the broader system more tools and and opportunities for people to to buy on the on the supply side um on the uh the planning side uh it's it's interesting and our our product is in kigali and they were going through sort of a planning and, and uh, uh, sort of master plan process. And we were kind of caught in between the middle of it. So we did have, um, uh, for example, the requirement to build like an insane amount of parking that like cost a lot of money that it was sort of a waste of money, but we had to do it. That actually was subsequently uh, modified. Uh, and, and so there are kind of policy things that can happen through zoning and through regulation that can help people to reduce um, uh, the cost of housing. Um, but the biggest challenge, I, I would say, and this is something that uh, you know, we benefited from having uh, uh, sort of technical assistance and, and support, but uh, uh, we still had issues with supply chain, with quality of, of labor. And so that is the part of the system that really does need investment, resourcing and to be a priority from people in government, from, from people in the private sector uh, to, to really make sure that as this work scales up and, and can be applicable to other countries, uh, other, other cities, other countries, other regions, uh, that that whole system of, of getting access to the skilled labor and, and to the quality materials is, a, is quite a big challenge. Uh, but I'll hand it over to, to Fatu. She's been doing this much more. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank, thank, thank you for the question. Um, and Justin's absolutely right. We're um, it's really fascinating because we're in. And again, the the local people who are on the chat as well. I mean, also feel free, I guess, to speak up. But we're in this context that's constantly building. The road is building itself as we're walking on it. So things are going to change, and there has to be built into your system. A, quite a bit of flexibility that has to be part of the design and I have to say also as, a, as an architect and designer that challenge is quite exciting daunting but quite exciting um, and so one of the things that in order to be able to procure more affordable housing um, the government's job of course is they're writing policies to think about you know the big scale solution so yes how to bring together and maybe do land consolidation to have people acquire land to build large developments however um, what they're actually starting to do now, and brings me a lot of hope, is looking at the smaller developers. There are so many people now who are developing five, six, eight units, um, maybe informally, but they're still providing those units consistently to the market at a price point that people are living in. Them. How do you actually begin to work with them, the backyard landlords or the household landlords who are building a house, you know, in many different neighborhoods? Um, how do you? start to, to have policies for them to continue to do what they're doing because that's currently the scale of the industry. The industry right now is not at the scale of providing 500 or 1,000 units in one go. We want to get there, but we're just, we're just not. And so um, I really think thinking about affordable housing really does start with the supply chain and thinking about uh, different, maybe less conventional methods of, of boosting and reinforcing the, the supply that's happening now and just making it better quality and safer and um, because it's going to happen anyway it's going to happen anyway so you may as well uh, assist those people in, in in doing it in a way that, that conforms more with the, the new policies and regulations yeah i'll i'll only add to that i th i think the idea of kind of the smaller scale or what we sometimes call kind of the incremental scale of development is a really important uh, sort of framework and very often in, in many places, especially with governments that are facing very large numbers and challenges, there, there's a, a bias toward the large and, and almost kind of transformative uh, project. Uh, but, but the idea of, of having 
hundreds or thousands of small five or 10 unit projects can happen at scale. It can happen in a more um, distributed and equitable way. And so that's something that, that we really like to encourage uh, people generally to kind of think in more incremental scales of development and not necessarily the project scale um, uh, because you know the large investors will, will want kind of the big project, everything's in one place, there's a certain amount of control, but that really is outside of the capacity of a lot of people to do locally, but also thinking long-term and learn, we went through this in the United States, guess what, it doesn't work, <laughs> right? You end up with um, mono uh, 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 sort of income neighborhoods, which can exacerbate, exacerbate um, social differentiation, uh, you end up with kind of uh, infrastructure challenges at, at those scales that, that really should be thought of comprehensively. So that was a really important point, that kind of incremental scale. Absolutely. And um, then to be able to think about incremental finance to go with it. And um, there are, and hi, Sita, uh, with the Center for Affordable Housing uh, Finance in Africa, actually working now and trying to see what are those those financial products that, be, that could be created to do the large scale stuff, but also to facilitate this incremental uh, building. And that's on the side, on the demand side, as well as on the supply side, because the developer, the cost of, of, of constructing and financing a development is incredibly high. You know, Justin could tell you his experiences um, uh, and his funding is coming from outside, but for those even getting local funding between high interest rates and short repayment periods, I mean, there's a whole lot that, that a whole lot of opportunity to do some rethinking there. And I'm, I'm really pleased that at least here in Rwanda that that thinking has, has started. It's underway. Uh, so I'll move us on to another set of questions. We had a, a trio of questions from, I'm gonna apologize in advance on the name, Wanja Kanuthia. Uh, so this is looking at uh, uh, how the systems change and this is to the American uh, black communities uh, uh, sort of now that people are really affected by food related issues uh, and, and a, I think a related set of questions uh, looking at uh, loan and tax systems in the USA and how that's working. And then finally, a third question on uh, how the, the, I assume the work that we were doing that was linking to ecology look at issues like um, uh, biodiversity. So I'll go through through all those. So um, the, the issues of kind of how different systems have changed is actually related to what we were just talking about. Uh, US policies have, have changed sort of significantly o over different timeframes. Uh, you know, the, the US kind of post-war era saw really significant and rapid changes to our, our urban environments. Uh, so everything from urban, re something called urban renewal. So kind of changing whole parts of the city, kind of de uh, demolishing them and rebuilding them uh, for things like housing and economic development and industry development, uh, but also things like highway construction, kind of large scale highways and other infrastructure projects that radically transformed um, American cities, and there was um, uh, in the U.S. a, a racialized, uh, you know, against sort of black and and brown people um, framework to that, but also uh, related to income. And, and frankly, as an outsider, when I go to um, a place in sub-Saharan Africa, that same model, that kind of rapid change paradigm of of the equivalent of urban renewal, kind of slum clearance large scale redevelopment and displacement are, are still happening in, in those contexts. And so a lot of those issues are actually really connected. That's actually why I wanted to share that work is because this is something that is, is in a way kind of universal uh, for, for you know, what lower income communities face. And it includes things like um, you know, food access and access to services. And so in the US, uh, there's been this sort of shift toward, uh, uh, I, I would say a dependency on uh, kind of larger scale uh, distribution and production of food that makes people fully dependent 
on those systems. Uh, it's a great way to keep people poor because poor people have to spend all their money. Uh, and if you make it the whole system designed in a way that poor people have to spend all their money on needs, so things like food, housing, and health, uh, you're, you're sort of setting up the whole system uh, to, to kind of keep the status quo. Um, and so the, the food projects are, are something that, uh, you know, was done at one stage in history. And in the U.S., there's a major resurgence to connecting things like food and health to issues like uh, uh, kind of sustainability and, and environmental justice. And so we're seeing a resurgence of these food programs uh, where we have community gardens, urban farms, uh, food cooperatives and kind of food access points that are being done while other urban development concerns are being addressed like affordable housing or like access to jobs. Uh, so we're seeing a, a return to that. Maybe it, you know things happen in cycles, uh, but I, I think it's positive that more people are working on this issue of, of uh, food access and thinking about it as integral to community development. Um, on the question on loans and tax, uh, in the US, uh, yeah, there, there is inequality uh, in our tax systems. In the United States, uh, renters, so people that, that pay money in rent for their housing, don't have any uh, tax advantages. People that own their homes are able to write off the interest that they're paying or a portion of their interest that they're paying on their loans off on their taxes to reduce their income. Uh, their taxable income. So someone that is paying $1,000 a month in rent gets no taxes, uh, not, no tax benefit. Someone that's paying $1,000 a month for a mortgage of which $900 is interest, right? They're able to write off that $900 and pay less taxes as a result. So there is an inequality that, that is sort of biased toward homeowners. Um, for a long time in the US, black people were not really able to access things like mortgages to even get to participate in that. The, the project that I shared with you, the, the Flanner House project, that that was a black developed project. It was, un, it was highly unusual that black people have those kind of mortgages for development of that type at that time. You know, like 99% of it went to, to white suburban families. Um, and so, you know, the system is there and people try to access it, but there are other kind of measures that need to be in place to, to deal with it. But there is an inequality and that's something that in other countries and other contexts that you really have to look at the whole system and to see where you're tipping the scales and to whose benefit as you're developing policies to ensure that you're, you're doing work to make things affordable. Um, and then the last question you had was uh, on, uh, monitoring biodiversity. So we, we do have bees. So we have uh, uh, beekeeping. My brother got stung real bad. It was funny. Um, uh, but uh, so we are thinking kind of holistically about the environmental um, dimensions of our work, but it's not something that we're actively monitoring, like in a scientific or, or rigorous way. But it's something that qualitatively, I can tell you that, you know, there are more birds and bees and butterflies and, and life um, in the, the project. I didn't share it here, but one of the major things that we've done with Urban Patch for years is a rain garden program. Uh, so we work with uh, the state to uh, get people different types of plants that will help them deal with stormwater runoff on their individual home sites. So there are literally hundreds of homes in the neighborhood as well that we've done rain garden projects. Um, so let's move on to the next question. This is a big one. Ooh. Okay, you ready? From uh, Makta, I believe. What would you say is the future of urban design and development in Africa? <laughs> Take it away. <laughs> <laughs> you. <laughs> um, well, I think the, the future is unlimited. It's also daunting. There's a lot of stuff happening. It's happening fast. There's a lot of pressure um, on land, on, uh, well, on all of our resources, and you need to be on your toes. And so I say the future of urban design, I mean, I guess it goes back to Justin's first slide, which is multi, is that urban design is a problem of building materials. It's a problem of the environment. It's a problem of 
uh, a structure, it's a problem of a policy or a legislation that might stop things from happening. That's what the future of urban design is, especially here in Africa. And the need for this kind of um, multidisciplinary, transsectoral, I mean, I can't remember the other words you used in your introductory slide, but that kind of lens and that kind of slicing of the issues, for me, that's really where the future is if we're going to be able to get some answers that are um, uh, from really from here and designed for this context and that can survive long term. I mean, that 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 would be the simplest way I would answer it. I don't know about you. Yeah, and I, I, I think, um, and this is a very biased um, of opinion on, on this topic because it's something that I'm personally trying to do. So I, I mentioned in the very beginning this concept of the diaspora. And, um, you know, I, I think more kind of sharing and exchange, frankly, one of the reasons we're doing this presentation today is to exchange, that we need to understand that we're in this work together and to look for models, inspirations, um, solutions, creativity from a lot of different people, because I think the future of urban development um, and urban design in Africa, I hope looks different from how we've seen it in uh, the US, in Asia, in the Middle East, in Europe, uh, because there are some problems, <laughs> known problems with that. There are some known positives to development in all those places, but uh, I, I wanna know what that is and what that looks like um, uh, in Africa. And it may be very, very different, frankly, from how uh, development has happened in other places. So the kind of the paradigm that, you know, development or success or uh, uh, growth, all these different things look like what you would see in Western Europe in uh, the major cities in, in Middle East or, or uh, East Asia or Latin America, et cetera, is what that should be for uh, 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 cities and development in Africa. So I, I hope that, it, it's, that it's very different and, and frankly, that it's something that we don't even know what it is uh, because there's a lot of learning and, and um, uh, kind of unpacking what that might be, like how we might do things different that are healthier, more sustainable, better reflect culture and identity, uh, and, and just have other values and orientations for how we build and how we live together. Um, and I see that you're, you're a high school student and you're, you asked about the role of youth. And I think that that is also um, uh, a part of it, right? So uh, there's often experts dealing with the problem and, and the solutions and everything. And young people can be a part of that and can and should be a part of the conversations um, and, and kind of participating and helping talk about the future because it, you are obviously a part of that future. Uh, so I just thank you for being here and participating because we, we need people like you. So go talk to your friends and <laughs> kind of, you know, get them to join in and, and taking interest in this type uh, of work. I think especially when it comes to housing, youth are gonna be really important because you have the flexibility for thinking and about what it is to live differently. And so what the ideas that we're trying to come up now for what the future of the city is, that's gonna be the city that you're living in, that you're working in, that you're raising your family in. So your voice is so, so critical now, you know, before you buy your first house, before you even, you know, head off to college possibly, um, or whatever you, you it is that you decide to do. But this, whatever it is that we're discussing and building is, for you and has to work for you and be used by you and make sense to you. And so having your voice in the dialogue, I think is absolutely, absolutely critical. So I joined Justin in saying thank you for, for joining. And um, yeah, bring bring your friends on board. And and, and um, if, if you'd like to talk more, I would love to exchange and hear what you think of what you see in your city and uh, where, where you'd like for it to go. Great. I have a, a related question from Foma. Hi, Foma, uh, in the in the chat. Um, uh, how can Africans be at the forefront of new urban design models on the continent 
as opposed to Western entities. <laughs> I love that face. <laughs> She's like, come on, man. Um, yeah, this is, uh, I'll, I'll quickly say this has been a big conversation um and you know and obviously the the project that we've done and developed um you know is still connected to like western knowledge and reference and all of that and things that we appreciate and so i kind of i want to fully acknowledge that same time there again there are some there are some positives to these models um but yeah how how it it's going to be opened up to provide access to more and other realms of knowledge is something that we've been working on. Uh, I'm, I'm coming obviously from the US um, system. My, my personal education and background was very Western centric. Um, and so there's other types of work needed aside from the, you know, this conversation, I think, to talk about how we learn other references, other cultures, uh, and frankly, to have um, African people be in conversation and leadership and to elevate their work and make it more visible um, so that it, it can be uh, sort of more broadly understood uh, and, ex and exchanged. Uh, I think um, Fatu's point earlier about uh, the local developers, right, the, the builders being African <laughs> um, or being local uh, is also kind of a, a part of that because there's there's the reality that the client also uh, sort of drives uh, uh, some of the possibilities or, or some of the interests, but um, Fatu or, or other people uh, from, from Columbia Global may have responses to this question as well. I think on, on my part, um, one of the things, and, and yes, the work that I showed you was done by you know, a Swiss project. <laughs> so again, um, you know, a, a foreign entity coming uh, to be able to try and kickstart an industry. But what we really tried to focus on was developing tools and a construction system. And so I think there was another question about the typology and whether it was suited for African taste. That was a discussion we had ad nauseum. And I think it's a really, really important one, which is why that map of all the copycats is so refreshing to me because we put out a construction system that wasn't architecture it was essentially a box right with just optimized finishes and things like that to get the cost down to get uh, you know what we thought was a smart usage of building materials then it's been taken and reinterpreted and, and maybe i should show next time all the different variations that are built and thought and have been reconceived and turned upside down by people here and i think that's if, if we can have this kind of systems thinking, then I, then I think that's something that can be shared cross-culturally and that people can then begin to, um, you know, it's not even appropriate because it's, it's, it's a shared idea and a shared conversation that then gets interpreted um, uh, based on local, local conditions. And so our, our solution here was brick focused because there's great quality clay in every single wetland at the bottom of every single hill. But once we shift and if we were to do this program in another country, it wouldn't be bricks necessarily. It would be whatever makes sense locally in that economy and that culture in terms of preferences. And those are the types of things that I think, and, and that openness and willing to interpret and explore, that's the essence of the work that, that we do. Uh, I mean, you really could, hopefully in, in 10 years, I'm, you hear me talking somewhere else and I've substituted bricks for something else for whatever other location I'm in. Um, that has its own logic and, and, and systems. Yeah, the, the other thing I would add to that is that, you know, the, let's call it the kind of the visual um, kind of space or, or designer characteristics of, of the architecture are, are there, but I think there, there are other layers of conversation about what makes it locally uh, sort of appropriate and, and um, uh, designed and and so conversations about you know how much space is allocated to shared spaces, uh, how much uh, space is allocated for maintenance and and kind of things that are very very uh, based on local preferences that that also get kind of factored into um, uh, uh, the design and development, even how he's kind of at the urban design and planning scale how and where things are located. Um, so there, there are multiple kind of types of design beyond um, uh, kind of the only the, the tangible building project that are part of that conversation as well. 
Um, so one more question. Uh, this must sound looks like for Fatu. Um, so the Great Lakes project, uh, how are you bringing in the ecological and biodiversity component to the building um, project? Uh, I know you were with the clay um, uh, system, right? Yeah. So one of the things is, as I just mentioned, you know, there are, thank you for the question, first of all. Um, there are wetlands in, in Kigali and those wetlands are, I mean, they're a lifeblood. If you take a transect, of most hills, you know, people are cultivating at the bottom in some neighborhoods and then selling at the top. And, you know, it goes through um, uh, the, the, the profile of the hill itself is, is, a, is a system. That's an incredible Western, sorry. <laughs> but um, uh, that, that type of, that, that type of um, usage of the wetland is really important. And so when we're trying to say, oh, come in now and start doing clay and things like that, our project starts at the extraction of that clay because how you treat that wetland um, uh, and how you properly extract clay to be able to take off the top layer, extract the clay, put the top layer back so that you can come and do fish farming or rice farming or other thing and not disrupt this whole other pattern of usage, this whole other narrative for those wetlands. That becomes really something that we've had to write into the project is that kind of dance between usages and seasons and that has all changed also as the, as the, the climate has changed in these farming seasons are getting long and short and long and short and rain means you can't get clay, et cetera. So um, we spend a lot of time on that. It's not as sexy as the houses. So I have to admit people don't often ask me, but um, I, I think that's a, that's a fantastic question that that's a, at the core of our project because if there's no clay and there's, and it's not true and the valleys aren't treated properly, there's no, there's no building, there's no industry happening. There's no green industry happening. Um, so, so that that's really where where um, at least where where our project starts. Yeah, and there there was a second part of the question I'll answer too. So I was asking about uh, playgrounds for children, and I I didn't present it, but um, uh, something that we actually did in our project, um, uh, our site wasn't uh, large enough for us to do public space uh, kind of directly on on. The site, but I care a lot about public space, and as a part of our um, development model, uh, we we did think about this, and so we actually worked with an organization called uh, the Playground Hub, um, uh, which is a, a Rondon organization that they build playgrounds in the city. Uh, something for folks who don't know, um, uh, Rondon or Kigali, uh, there's definitely a, a huge need for new public spaces. Uh, uh, and, and especially more active kind of usable public spaces, like not just nice, pretty green space, but a space that is actually usable for people and including children. Uh, and so this organization is doing work to, to build new playgrounds uh, throughout the city. So as a part of our development project built, built into our development model, uh, we, we took a, a small percentage of our, our budget and dedicated it to uh, the construction of a new playground, public playground. Uh, in, in Gasabo, which is the district that that um, uh, our project is located within, and, and something that you know, as we continue to do more projects, we'll look at models uh, where maybe there's a, so some kind of public amenity on on the actual site if the site is large enough, or if it makes sense, or if not, to make sure that there are other kinds of contributions uh, that come along with development. Because we did, you know, we built in a a more single family fabric uh, community, a higher density project, which means there are more people that are gonna be in that community. And so uh, there, there should be all the other amenities that, that are part of it and go with it uh, a, as a part of our, our development. So thank you for that question. Oh, this is another one for Fatu. So uh, these models look like they're a great model for other African uh, cities experiencing similar challenges. Are there plans for cross country expansion? Uh, and also, is there any intention to influence national building standards or policies? I'll give that one to you. Um, so, so great question. Will will <clears throat> um, the Swiss have have, have invested in? in Done it with SCAT have invested have invested in um, uh, similar building material projects like this around the world, Latin America, uh, a lot in uh, Southeast Asia, 
and then um, the recurring ones here in, in the Great Lakes region. And so will it continue? I, I hope so. Um, but you know, also with donors, there are trends of projects. You know, building materials is sexy for a while, and then all the donors will start doing something else. But I'm hoping that, you know, people like me, people like you who are interested in things like this, that we can start in our communities having those types of dialogues and in the different African cities where we have relationships and, and be able to, to, since we have the guidebook for how this should be done, that we can be able to jumpstart these conversations that we don't need a donor to come in and say, hey, exactly. this, is gonna, this is how you're doing, but that it could be grown from us. I don't know if I'm being absolutely naive, but personally, that, that's my goal. And that's kind of why I left my job, <laughs> um, <laughs> was because I, I, I really think that that's, that's the next step, um, is for the dialogue to grow from, from underneath. But yes, officially as a part of the project, there is a whole component about skills transfer, putting the skills to build bricks, to design houses, to build houses into training centers, but then also at the policy level that the Rwanda Standards Boards have these technologies approved by, uh, by the Standards Board, included in the building code, check that's done, Standards Board is done, that the brick qualities are approved. Because again, quality is, first of all, quality is more profitable but anybody who's starting an industry thinks that they have to invest more to get a better quality, but they actually, if they make those investments, they get better productivity and a better product. But for that, you need a client or a policy that demands that you give that quality. Otherwise, if they can cut corners, they will continue to do it. But that's all part of industry transformation. So yes, there is always a heavy policy and standards component. And then also at the, at the national level, but at the local level as well. Uh oh, Lillian is telling us we're over. Yeah, yeah, we're we're at our time, but thank thank you all uh, so much for the questions. And I do want to give a quick plug. Uh, I saw Josephine. Hi, Josephine was in the <laughs> chat and noted that women-led projects. So we had procured in our project from a woman-owned brick factory, for example, and and Fatu uh, now is able to do work sub-Saharan context uh, with all of this wonderful knowledge. And so if folks are interested, definitely reach out and connect with, with her because this work is needed everywhere. Um, but with that, I'll hand it over to Lillian. Thank you all so much for your great questions and engagement. Wow, wow. that was nice, great, good work. Thank you, um, Professor Moore and uh, Fatu. We really, um, appreciate your valuable contribution to this webinar. It was fantastic. I've enjoyed, I've learned. It was very informative. And uh, thank you for your support to the center and also to our audience. And to our audience, we really value your support and your participation. And we hope to see you in our next um, session of the series, Healthy City series, as well as other webinars which are in the pipeline. And um, with that, I would like to appreciate all of you and wish you a splendid evening, morning as well, or afternoon, wherever we are. And uh, thank you so much. Bye.